it's now, it's now. Folks, could you get settled, please? We are about one minute away from our scheduled start. And please move up. Please, please, please move up. Good morning, Jane. Folks, there are plenty of seats up here. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 2017 Kellogg Lecture at EDS. I'm Angela Bauer-Lebeck, the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean, and And it, is my, and it is my honor to introduce to you today's Kellogg Lecturer, the Reverend Dr. Shell A. Kujawa Holbrook. Welcome back, dare I say, welcome home, Shell. Many of us know the Reverend Dr. Cheryl Kujawa Holbrook as the Suzanne Radley Hyatt Professor of Feminist Pastoral Theology and Church History during the decade from 1998 to 2009, and Academic Dean, my direct predecessor from 2005 to 2009, among other roles, before she departed for Southern California where she has served as Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty and Professor of Practical Theology and Religious Education at Claremont School of Theology in Claremont, California. Simultaneously, she has been Professor of Anglican Studies and Religious Education at Bloy House, the Episcopal School of Theology at Claremont with which EDS has a partnership. 
Dr. Kujawa Holbrook holds numerous academic degrees, three master's degrees, including the MDiv from EDS in 1983, and two doctorates, an EDD of the Joint Program in Religion and Education from Union Seminary and Columbia University Teachers College in 1993, and in the same year, a PhD from Boston College in American Christianities. She is the author, co-author, or editor of 14 books, numerous book chapters and articles, and among her most recent ones are the writings of Hildegard of Bingen, 2016, God Beyond Borders, Interreligious Learning Among Congregations in 2014, and Pilgrimage, The Sacred Art Journey to the Center of the Heart, which won the Best Spiritual Book of 2013 award. Calling her prolific would be an understatement. <laughs> with over 30 years of experience as a teacher, trainer, spiritual director, chaplain, workshop conference and retreat leader, including many years of work with young people across the Episcopal Church, the Reverend Dr. Cheryl Kujawa Hobrook has always made the connections between congregations, faith traditions, and the practical needs of people in the everyday. Today, she will guide us as we consider EDS past, present, and future. The title of her lecture is Identities, Resistance, Hope, EDS Transforming from Institution to Movement. It is my honor and privilege to introduce to you the Reverend Dr. Cheryl A. Kujaba Hobro. Chris Carr says I'm supposed to not move. Are you going to have to stand there this whole time? Oh. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Good morning. It's very good to see all of you, and I was reflecting on it. It's, I suppose, very nice to be here for this extremely difficult occasion, right? I thought, when I first got the call, I thought, well, you know, the faculty and the administration and the alumni executive committee have a lot of faith in me. And besides, I moved to a warm climate, so they're going to get me back. And uh, ask me to have a, this opportunity to reflect with you. And I, when I was dean, I never actually got to hear much of the Kellogg lectures because I was always worrying where the food was or doing what Chris did with the microphones and things like that. So this is an opportunity for me to kind of recreate uh, that space in this space because as I was in morning prayer this morning, I went, you know, this is, to me anyway, this feels like a Kairos moment. Those moments when the past and the present and the future are aligned. And if we reflect on it, most of us get just a few of those moments just a few of those moments during our entire lives. And they're usually not easy, but they are poignant. So I urge you to be attentive to this moment in this space where over a century of people uh, fought and prayed and sang uh, and lived and married and were buried, right? All from this wonderful place. And so, we're, we're, they're in here with us now, I think. They're in here with us now. And uh, that doesn't necessarily make our task any easier, but it is a, a form of solidarity. It is a form, our spirituality connects us through a very porous veil uh, to those that lived in the past and those that will be EDS in the future. So in terms of spiritual practice, I urge you to try to go into, I know it's hot, uh, but try to go into a mode of attending. And I promise you, I, I won't go over time. So those people who have their messages or like to know where things are going, I won't go over time. Uh, but try to, try to settle in. 
the space and also let the space speak to you as we uh, meet together today. The other thing I wanted to encourage you to do is uh, while you're reflecting, because I know we, we now live in an age of multitasking, so while I'm talking, try to think of word or words, one, two, three words, that sum up for you what EDS is about. The two I settled on are powerful and prophetic. But there is a space about three quarters through the lecture that we're all going to have an opportunity to say what those words are. I was trying to think of how to make this pedagogically um, more like EDS, more voices, uh, because this, you know, this format uh, doesn't necessarily easily lend itself to that kind of experience. So I urge you to, to just reflect on those words. We'll all have an opportunity to say them together. I'll give you a signal. It's about three quarters through the lecture. But will it be an opportunity for us to have that experience of Pentecost, that multivocal, as my friend Christopher DeRising said about 100 times a day when I worked with him, <laughs> <laughs> or in class, like 100 times, multivocal. That word belongs to Christopher for me, right? I feel like I'm quoting him when I use that word. So that, that's where I urge you to also put your, some reflective energy. And it's a way that we can bear witness to our experience of EDS. The other thing I'm doing, and this will uh, process through to the panel after lunch, is uh, I try to organize the lecture around a process that we're going to do a little piece of, but it's called strategic questioning. And the purpose of strategic questioning is that, uh, like today, there are many questions uh, about uh, where we are uh, politically, where we are spiritually, where we are institutionally, that don't necessarily have immediate answers. But the issue isn't that we need to have answers for all questions. Strategic questions are those questions that come to us in the midst of uh, organizational or spiritual uh, trauma, in the midst of transition, in the midst of change. And the, the important thing about questioning is that it's, it's part of agency, right? Uh, questioning it helps us see there is another way through, it helps us see that borders are permeable, it helps us see that we can do more if you're educated like myself, I can look at something and analyze what's wrong with it from 30 different angles. But I needed to teach myself to question, because in questioning, I can see possibility, right? So think about, and we'll maybe have some time during the Q&A today or the, or the Q&A uh, after lunch at the panel, what are those strategic questions for you when we think about EDS as a movement and EDS going forward. Because those questions are formative. They don't necessarily have one answer, but they, they're helpful in us discerning a path, right? And a path is about the future. A path is generative. A path gives us an idea. You know, uh, agency is a pathway to hope, right? And until we can get ourselves back to questioning, uh, and, and that's what EDS is about to me. It's about questioning. Uh, if you all misbehave a little, I'll feel a lot better about this. <laughs> because now I'm hesitant about the word and stuff because also, and I'm including myself, people associated with EDS are not good at following instructions. <laughs> it's not our strong suit. But that's a good thing, right? That's a good thing in the moment we're living in. That is perfectly appropriate behavior, right? So let's... Um, <laughs> You know, uh, so let's move forward in that spirit and be ourselves and be more ourselves, be our best selves. And then we, we have some hope for the future. Uh, in uh, collecting my thoughts uh, for this lecture, there um, is a text that came to me, and so I want to share it with you. But first I want to begin with a uh, blessing from the Union of Black Episcopalians that my mentor, Ed Rodman, always used to 
precede his addresses. Let there be peace among us and let us not be instruments of our own or another oppression. Amen. Amen. This is from Dr. King. This is the text that came to me, 1963. This is our hope. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. First, some context. This is EDS after all. First, context. We live today in an era of political, societal, ethical, environmental, and spiritual collapse. This collapse is an eminent reminder that history is not the record of linear progress, but a spiral by which we visit our tidal questions cyclically. Through each cycle, we have the capacity to revisit on higher levels of consciousness or lower levels of consciousness. Maya Angelou, in a quote from the poem that Catherine read yesterday and also one of Ed Rodman's favorite quotes, said the following in her inauguration poem on the pulse of the morning. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. In the process of history, what constitutes progress in Western terms is not guaranteed or even necessarily the goal. What we need instead of false notions of progress is to examine how humankind in this era, as Dr. King explained over 50 years ago, can actively engage the capacity to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. The full system collapse we are experiencing is, in historical terms, predictable, as Dr. Batts reminded us at graduation. A book by Nikhal Pal Singh of New York University entitled Race and America's Long Way, to be published in October 2017, traces the interconnections between racism and war as permanent features of American political life. From the time of African slavery, territorial expansion, the removals of native peoples, settler migration and nativism, to the continuous warfare after 9-11-2001, the cycles of racism and war culminate in the November 2016 presidential election. The chaos, fear, and anxiety stirred by our return to another era of white supremacy is one level of human response, though dangerously inadequate if we do not meet the challenge with action precipitated by higher levels of consciousness than we have in the past. The characteristics of chronically anxious societies or organizations or schools or churches or families are reactivity, blaming, hurting, quick fixing, and generally lead to regressive leadership. In institutions, the presence of the past can contribute to either the ability to thrive or the inability to change. I interpret my own disillusionment and lack of preparedness for this collapse as a consequence of my white privilege. My responsibility for this privilege compels me to get over existential malaise quickly. We know from systems theorists that all pathogenic forces, whether we are considering destructive people, totalitarian nations, or malignant cells, are invasive by nature and do not learn from past experiences. We have been here before, and our sisters and brothers are increasing danger, and the numbers of the endangered are escalating. We are failing the second great commandments, to love our neighbors as ourselves, we are failing to see the imago dei in all peoples. It is the work of those of us who see the possibilities within religion for the liberation of all humankind, indeed the liberation of all creatures, to act together to end this downward spiral and to transform the planet 
to a higher level of consciousness. Our present moment is one where recent memories about who we thought we were as a society are crumbling, and the new order, though solidifying at an alarming rate, is not yet fixed. Our stones of hope, as Dr. King taught, lie in the belief that in the current mountain of despair, humankind has the capacity to act despite the chaos, fear, and anxiety to be worthy once again of the God in whose image we were created. It is an obligation of religious leadership to act in this historical moment in order to more fully realize God's dream for us in the present as well as what hope we may have for our future. The first question. How is it that the most pluralistic country in the world is experiencing a rise in white supremacy? The tragedy of the 20th century and its aftermath have awakened many anew to the complex interaction of race, religion, culture, and by extension, other forms of oppression. In states like California, there is no majority. The Houston metropolitan area is now the most diverse in the country. Similar demographic shifts, why uneven across the United States, will accelerate in this century. The idea of people from different racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds living in close proximity is a reality. Looking at the data, it appears unrealistic to talk about any religious or cultural group in isolation from the others which surround it, either in this country or abroad. Despite the pluralistic nature of American society, racism, along with religious bigotry, has been a major issue in this country from its inception. The predominantly European Christian settlers of North American continent, often interested in political and religious freedom for themselves, along with economic gains, systematically oppress Native peoples, people of African ascent, as well as members of religious groups other than their own. Indeed, throughout American history, religion is as much a tool of oppression as it is a source of human liberation. Blatantly racist ideologies and religious discourse are evident throughout our history, and while obscured or buried at times, were never fully eradicated. The racism, heterosexism, classism, sexism, religious oppression, gender oppression, and oppression related to immigration status are now promulgated as a form of religious, predominantly Christian discourse. Though most major Christian groups repudiate some forms of oppression, though not all, officially, the historical records suggest a direct relationship between the dynamics of oppression and religious institutions. While preaching and teaching on the history of oppression in the United States has, historic, has historically focused on relationships between communities, the messages from our great social justice prophets have not been implemented for the most part, on a structural level, nor have we successfully built a consensus on the intersexual nature of oppression. Further, that we in the United States have hardly begun to unpack our complicity with colonialism or our support for colonialism and colorism throughout the world suggests the need to expand and update our paradigm from a global perspective. Recent direct actions against Native peoples within the United States, the escalation of violence against immigrants, refugees, and all people associated with Islam, as well as the system systemic dismantling of what limited environmental protections we managed to put into place, suggest that those of us who identify with a Christianity rooted in liberation, in freedom for all, and the sanctity of creation are losing or worse, have lost our voice in our own religious discourse. Our complicity with the systems of white supremacy continue to distance us from each other and from all that is holy. Or so it appears from the perspective of the exclusivist ideology that is masquerading as Christianity in much of the media today. Another question. What then is the role of theological education amid systemic collapse. The Reverend Dr. Angela Sims, a Christian social ethicist, writes of the recent impact of the 11-9 election 
on theological education. She writes, in this post-11-9 season, I realize that as an administrator and theological faculty member, I do have a responsibility to create space where students can reflect on ways in which they are both compelled to appeal to the moral conscience of the nations and to articulate an ethics of ecclesiology that demonstrates their understanding of the nature, purpose, and function of church and its relationship to Christ and white supremacy." End of quote. In a time of egregious injustice, in an era of human rights violations where very few are exempt or removed, theological educators cannot acquiesce, remain silent, or be passive and neutral and continue in a business as usual that will not serve us well. From a global perspective, our own Dr. Kwok Pulan writes about the need for theological education from the perspective of a post-colonial theology that, and I quote, involves cultivating a habit of decolonizing the mind, resurrecting suppressed theological knowledge, and in taking part in social praxis to contest empire and change the world. Post-colonial theology will only be words if it is not embodied in alternative forms of faith communities and ecclesial, ecclesial practices, Eucharistic table habits, ways of listening, contextual music making, confronting oppression intersectionally, hospitality for religious neighbors, and mutual mission. The post-colonial church, and I add by extension, theological education, is not a cozy and secure place reinforcing the status quo and that we already know. It is a messy in-between space that God's grace beyond human understanding can be made known. Thank you, Pula. Theological education today is in between times, and as some would say, has lost ground in terms of its prophetic identity and voice. That is, many of the old operating assumptions have slipped away, but we have not yet to reach a new equilibrium. The small, freestanding schools like Episcopal Divinity School are the most vulnerable, but even large institutions with large endowments are taking economy measures. Given the predictions that the United States will be a majority-minority country by 2040, there remains a great need from across traditions for religious leadership that is equipped to build bridges and to draw on the resources already present in our diverse communities. Theological schools like EDS, committed to systemic change and critical multiculturalism, are among the most vulnerable, often sharing in the lack of access to resources and the structural supports which challenge their faculties, their students, their staffs, and their administrations, and the communities they serve. Here I am referring to theological schools where commitment to operational pluralism transcends the numerical diversity of marginalized groups by taking seriously the pedagogical, cultural, and systemic changes needed to truly serve and support marginalized students, faculty, staff, and faith communities. Further, educational theorists argue that the cultural survival that exists in much of American education today is indicative of the widespread uncertainty experienced at all levels of, about the prospects for human civilization and lasting peace. Facing decline and complete reversals of the expectations for human progress from the previous century, educational praxis in the 21st century, it is argued, must confront deeply embedded denial, despair, and loss. The next strategic question. This is a hard one for me, but, but I, it's an important one. Is it even possible for a theological school which takes racism and other forms of oppression seriously to survive? This is definitely a both end. Thank you, Valerie Batts. <laughs> The answer to this question may be found in looking at social movement scholarship, 
pertaining to schools and other racially and socioeconomically diverse organizations, and then extrapolating those findings to theological education contexts. A recent study published by the American Sociological Association found that while organizations benefit from internal diversity, that same diversity also contributes to significant organizational challenges. Potential benefits include gains in innovation and creativity, increased legitimacy and strategic capacity. The challenges to, to diverse organization includes threats to organizational stability, concerns about governance, efficacy, and survival. For example, one study examined multidimensional diversity within organizations and found that a high degree of internal diversity, including racial, socioeconomic, and religious factors, can lead to tensions generated through asymmetrical power relations in governance. Hello. <laughs> um, part of doing research is to like prove what you already know, but there we go. Um, uh, these ongoing tensions threaten the overall stability of all the organizations studied, a key factor to the long-term success of social movements. Similar trends can be found in research on urban schools. Though the challenges are not unique to metropolitan areas, it is clear, however, that the challenges cannot be separated from the socio-demographic context. It should be noted that these same challenges are escalating in theological schools which strive to serve diverse constituencies. Structural challenges such as limited student access to educational resources which enhance academic success, students' overall academic readiness for advanced education, the quality of student and faculty internal and external support systems, the lack of instructional coherence, and chronic budgetary and resource challenges. In addition, studies have indicated critical cultural challenges which result in an overall cultural dissonance that manifests itself in deeply embedded educational practices, policies, beliefs, and outcomes which do not relate to the experience of the students or their local communities. These elements of cultural dissonance include, but are not limited to the following. Perceptions of race, gender, and class as limiting the potential of some students, the lack of culture and language competency among faculty and staff, perceptions from board members that more diverse contexts are less successful, learning styles that suggest intellectual deficiencies and critical messages, both overt and subliminal, about how much or how little some language and cultural groups are valued in the school and the larger society. During the first decade of the 21st century, theological schools under the leadership of the Association of Theological Schools, or ATS, sponsored multiple initiatives aimed at the social inclusion, in quote, of racial ethnic diversity in theological education. Decades earlier, similar initiatives were created which continue the focus on gender bias in binary terms, though, gender, in theological education, specifically around the issues of women leadership. These efforts have served to increase the numbers of women and racial ethnic faculty and students in theological schools. However, the focus of these initiatives is on, on improving the demographics of schools and resourcing schools' capacity for managing diversity. These initiatives leave unaddressed the past and present racism and sexism experienced by faculty and students in predominantly white theological schools and do not at all address homophobia, other forms of oppression, or the intersectional relationship between oppressions. One of the gifts of EDS to the church and to the world is its historic emphasis on the importance of social identities and social contexts in doing theology as well as the school's commitment to the kind of theology which privileges the voiceless. Here's a quote, decades of you read this in Foundation, from Yong Yang Lee. We used it so much I had to put him in the lecture and give him credit. I must have, I signed it for years. 
Telling my story is not itself theology, but a basis for theology. Indeed, the primary context for my doing theology. This is why one cannot do theology for another. If theology is contextual, it must certainly be at root autobiographical. The teaching and learning at EDS integrates intersectional ideas, identities into theology and ministry. Race, gender identity and expression, sexual identity, social class, ability, language, immigration status, HIV status, addiction status, etc. Why EDS is not always a comfortable place, for many it is a sacred space and a rare opportunity to be part of a community that not only welcomes differences, but continues to push the boundaries and re-examine examine systemic biases. To me, this capacity to critically claim intersectional identities as integral to ministry is at the core of discipleship. It is apparent that Jesus' focus in his public ministry was on expanding the boundaries of community to include those most, most feared. Samaritans, Roman soldiers, other Gentiles, sex workers, tax collectors, sinners in general, rather than teaching about who should be excluded. There is a school of opinion in the Christian world which argues that the institutional church is going down because we continue to bring up controversial issues like justice, and hang out with the wrong people, which is most of us. <laughs> but the idea that moderation contributes to growing membership is reminiscent of the mid 20th century when the church was much more accepted as part of the dominant culture. Today, what is attractive in religious movements is not conformity, but passion, authenticity, and commitment as well as the ability to form community across differences with, with those from other religious groups and those, those of no religion who share in the vision of the common good. In a climate of growing intolerance, we should not forget that genuine welcome fills a deep need. Works taught at EDS a generation ago inform our struggles today. For example, and this is just one title we used when I was here, The Color of Faith by Fumitaka Matsuoka, offers advice how to regain moral agency during systemic collapse. And he writes, the starting point is not to find ways of uniting people divided by fear and violence, but to recognize, celebrate, and learn from God's gift of one creation embodied in varied cultures, languages, religions, and races. It is to restore moral integrity in the midst of a culture of decay by restoring freedom and dignity to the captives we held." End of quote. Identity formation is a spiritual issue, and when positive identity formation is neglected, a common response is to view difference as a threat, with the resultant identities formed in opposition or over against the other. We are living now with the consequences of negative identity formation, fragmentation, nationalism, militant fundamentalism, global confirmation, confrontations, or what some call the clash of barbarisms, to name a few. Gregory of Nyssa, one of the Cappadocian fathers who in the fourth century vigorously opposed slavery as incompatible with the Christian tradition believe that only in universal freedom can humanity live into our fullness. Gregory believed God was made visible through relationships. Only through the practice of universal freedom, inclusive of all, are we living into the fullness of our humanity. If God is inseparable from the human condition, if we are all God bearers, then we all have divine potential. The closest we can get to becoming God lies in the way we act together to bring this universal freedom into fruition. It has been integral to the theological orientation of EDS throughout the generations to teach theology in ways that acknowledges individual stories and the value of context. Appreciate that there is not one truth, 
but multiple centers of truth that both and again, and to cultivate prophetic pastors, religious leaders, international scholars who thrive in pluralism while standing deeply within their own traditions, ever challenging the status quo. It is this kind of religious leadership that members of the EDS diaspora need to actively demonstrate in our local communities and the world today. Another question. <clears throat> if the purpose of theological education is related to the mission of the church, what is the mission of the church? It's also moving, as you know. This is a generative question which infuses all baptismal living. Our own Frederica Harris Thompson writes, the theological foundation for baptismal living is grounded in the expectant hope God hauls out for each of us. Pursued in humanity's hope-filled response in seeking God's reign and expressed in the persistent hopefulness of daily living." End of quote. Obviously, there isn't a single answer to how the mission of the church will ultimately be impacted by the current conditions or what this has to do with theological education. Yet it is an opportunity to envision the future from the perspective of abundance. The sign suggests that like EDS, what is now known as the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement, all institutional Christianity and all theological education are undergoing major changes that we've been talking about at least since the 1970s. It always takes us a generation to notice a change. Well, ecclesiastical organizations are usually, like we started declining in numbers in 1983 and then started talking about it a generation later. Though we do not know what the church will look like a century from now, we do know that our hope is expressed by the expectation of resurrection. Jesus is not buried, his tomb is empty, and he left his movement to us. He did not leave a book, he did not leave an institution, he left to us a movement. Interestingly, very little of Jesus' public ministry took place within traditional religious spaces, except for a few scenes, and those did not turn out very well. <laughs> Larry Wills knows more about this than I do. but um, He spent a great deal of his time on the road, teaching among the people. God came among us in the person of Jesus to start a movement, said presiding Bishop Michael Curry this past Easter, a movement to change the face of the earth a movement to change us who dwell upon the earth, a movement to change the creation from the nightmare that is often made of it into the dream that God intends for it. A spirituality of resistance is embedded deep within the Christian faith for those of us who choose to recognize it. Just as Jesus of Nazareth called out those in his own tradition who were too comfortable with the Roman Empire, so too, his followers in this age are challenged to resist the current empire. Scripture is filled with stories of God's anger when humanity fails to resist the forces of domination and death, even to the extent of losing everything. On the one hand, our failure to resist the present systemic collapse could result in death by irrelevance. On the other hand, and an even more deeply troubling scenario would be to become identified as a people comfortable with the status quo, at peace with oppression, thereby losing our moral agency in the present and all connection with our prophetic past. William Stringfellow, a prophet of the Episcopal Church in the 20th century, saw the Christian faith as a call to dissent and warned against biblical interpretations that suggest the United States is divinely ordained. Rather than surrender to human politics and focus on institutional survival, Stringfellow believed that the purpose of the church was to lead people into greater freedom. Institutions, he argued, are calibrated to sacrifice everything in the interest of survival, including their own people. To be sure, 
There is some romance about the Christian movement of the first three, three centuries that gathered disciples around their commitment to follow Jesus. Yet it is also the case that during every Reformation, including the one in the present, the church goes back to those earliest centuries to see where we may have gotten off course or lost our way entirely. Throughout social and religious history, movements have referred to group efforts to mobilize people around a cause or vision. Movement boundaries are permeable and allow for a flexibility of membership. Movements are orientated towards the needs of people in local communities and focus as much on listening as they do on speaking. Movement leaders are those who have the charism of recognizing systemic injustices and making them visible and organizing people to become more aware about what is going on around them and inspiring them to speak out and to advocate for change. Movements are also about bringing global perspectives to local communities and sharing resources with our neighbors in efforts aimed at bringing peace with justice to the whole world. The originality and power of the early Jesus movement was not about reorganizing programs, but in offering people an alternative reality, where those on the outside became the inside. It was not about comfort or survival, but in giving freely to all and creating new communities amid the people. It is our challenge in the next hours, days, weeks, months, years, as we move on from the bonds of EDS as an institution to turn her inside out, to free the voices of the people, and to continue to challenge the church and beyond to be more aligned with the reality of a community of the resurrection. Next question. What then is our hope? Where is there hope for EDS as we look to the future? We know from scripture, this is from Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 12. I know all you Episcopalians have the Bible committed to memory, so I'm making sure I give you the verses. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. In Pauline literature, hope is indicative of an abundant life and a central element of Christian spirituality. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, writes Hebrews, the conviction of things not seen. Biblical hope runs through both testaments as a strength of the people in times of systemic collapse, when their old securities are destroyed and the state of the future is unknown. As the prayer book says, let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. One of my favorite definitions of hope is from Augustine of Hippo. I have a love-hate relationship with Augustine of Hippo. He like what he did to Western Christianity, not so good. But then he comes up with these incredibly beautiful things, and I resent it, but there they are. Um, hope, hope has two daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain as they are. Easter should not be limited to the story of Jesus, as inspiring and hopeful as it is. Easter must be our story too. Jesus who lives in us died but did not die. We bear witness to the fact that were we to know the resurrection in our own lives as well. We have been crucified, each one of us, one way or another, and have been raised up again. This is our way of recognizing that transformation is always possible, always ongoing, until our hearts beat as one with God. In the Christian tradition, resurrection occurs through struggle and loss, when we allow a space for hope to grow within us. To experience resurrection, we need to discern the patterns that reveal God despite the harsher le lessons of life. From pastoral theology, we know that it is not enough for pastors to ask, where is God in periods of struggle and loss, without also asking the question that builds resilience. How do we understand our participation in God's dream for the future? Agency has a direct connection to hope. In this sense, all are called upon to become pastoral theologians. 
to interpret theologically the realities of daily living as well as the larger patterns of life in the world. At some point, hope must be chosen. I understand hope to be about the integration of my personal story, my community narratives, my vision of liberation for all creation, and my yearning for God. The denial of pain and suffering, my own or another's, is antithetical to authentic hope. Authentic hope cannot be born by numbing ourselves to our own pain or by living in the denial of others' struggles. Choosing hope does not change painful realities. Rather, it points to the transformation that occurs when God is present even in the most painful and challenging situations, when we are raised from the dead again and again. Hope is not the same as optimism, at least not in a theological sense. It's not about looking on the bright side or being cheery in difficult situations. Hope is a choice, and often it would be easier to remain numb than to be present in the face of the atrocities that humanity is capable of committing. As Dom Helder Camera writes, hope without risk is not hope. Hope requires courage to undergo a transformation when there is no determined outcome. Last summer, I was looking through the Christian century, um, and I, uh, I always look at the poetry. And I came upon this poetry, and it, was, it, it struck me as strange because it was in August, but to me it's an Easter poem. And it also has an image from Ash Street. And um, I spent many times going from this campus down Ash Street to the monastery, right? It's a, it's a regular uh, pa pattern that I had when I was here. And so I share this with you because I, I kept it on my desk for all these months thinking this is going to come in handy sometime. And then, <laughs> EDS, OK. Um, it's by Brian Doyle. And it's called, Could There Be a Badger Jesus? He writes, you want to hear a resurrection story? I'll tell you a resurrection story. I saw a squirrel get squished in the street. This was on Ash Street, near where a family named Penance lives. Things like this rivet me. Religions don't live in churches. Religions are not about religion in the end. Their vocabularies. This squirrel got hammered. I mean, a car ran right over it, and the car spread, sped down the hill. And I recall thinking that some dog would soon be delighted to be rolling ecstatically in squirrel oil. But then, even as I watched, the animal resumed its original shape and staggered off into the laurel thicket, inarguably alive and mobile if somewhat rattled and unkept. Jesus and Lazarus must have known that feeling of being sore in every joint and utterly, totally fixated on a shower and coffee in a sandwich. <laughs> or walnuts, depending, I suppose, on the species. Our current form is a nebulous idea, is what I'm trying to say. Could it be that resurrections are normal and the one we're always going on about in Christianity is only one a long time ago, when there are millions per day. Could there be an insect Jesus and a badger Jesus and a salmon Jesus? Could there be impossibly zillions of Jesuses? Isn't that really the whole point? A colleague in pastoral theology, the Reverend Dr. Duane Bidwell, has done a great deal of research into the way that human beings structure hope amidst pain and suffering. The research is specifically focused on terminally ill children, yet points more broadly to implications for spiritual care, as well as to how communities grow hopeful, even in desperate situations. What is interesting about this work is that it documents through scientific method what many prophetic religious leaders claim. That is, that hope is not only cognitive and existential, but it is also a social artifact. It is relational, participatory, perceptual, and kinesthetic. Moreover, hope is conative. It is not a passive experience, but a chosen response to present situations. The research finds that there are five pathways through hope. 
The first pathway, maintain identity, suggests that participation in the structures, activities, and rituals of community, like we're doing now, pre present before the onset of the trauma, are integral to activating hope. Hope is relational, and thus those ways in which we realize connections are a pathway to hope through building mutuality and inculcating trust. These contribute to a sense that we're not alone in our suffering, and this activates a sense of hope. The third pathway to hope is claiming power, or our capacity to advocate, set goals, maintain health, and otherwise have agency in challenging situations. The research suggests that hope is not only relational, but sapiential, in that it is related to our capacity to develop and Number four, learn wisdom through integrating a noetic assurance of well-being to a broader ethic of care and desire to give back to the community and the larger world. Lastly, attending to God, also known as prayer, is a pathway to hope. In research terms, prayer is relational and, connect, and created through the interplay of social processes, individual internalized resources and a transcendent presence. As a pathway to hope, prayer reminds us of the presence of the spirit and acts as a resource of ongoing consolation. To live in hope in any age requires a great deal of spiritual stamina. Our Jewish and Christian forebears teach us how hope is created and sustained in community. What ancient Jews experienced amid the loss of Jerusalem and what ancient Christians experienced in the death of Jesus were cataclysmic losses. They were shaken to the core of their religious identities and had to face their painful realities in the present to live and hope for the future. This process required them to face their present reality, to tell the truth, to resist by publicly expressing their anger, their rage, their grief, over once again facing uncertainty. As in the present day, our ancestors faced antipathy from those who chose to live in denial, those who manipulated for gain, and those who turned to violence. Every major religion or re spiritual tradition acknowledges that humankind strays from the path of justice, but hope for the future is based in the transformation of suffering. Hinduism views life as a process that leads to the eternal transformation into divine energy. Buddhism teaches that enlightenment is the path that ends suffering. Judaism awaits the Messiah, who will transform the unjust world into the glory of God. Islam teaches transformation from the burdens of human life to spiritual freedom through submission to God. Christianity embraces transformation from death to life through the crucifixion death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The stories preserved in our traditions signify the transformation promised to all and are shared through the generations so we might recognize the possibility of hope during the struggles and losses which comprise human existence. Embedded in each tradition is a spirituality of hope that imbues followers with the power if it is chosen to believe in life, to cope with life, whatever the losses and burdens it brings. It is an invitation to look at struggles of life in order that we might recognize our life in our souls. The answer to how we access this hope lies in the stories of struggle and hope that each of our traditions preserve. These stories shape our futures as well as our past. A contemporary Christian voice of hope is Sarah Miles, of St. Gregory of Nyssa Episcopal Church in San Francisco. Miles believes that Jesus' mission was basically about feeding, healing, forgiving, and raising the dead. Even though we spent a lot of time in schools and churches crafting complicated mission statements and arguing about verbs, here, the mission of the Jesus Movement can be captured in four actions, feeding, healing, including those with pre-existing conditions which is most of us, forgiving and raising the dead. I don't know about you, as I get older, my definitions get smaller as opposed to the, like the 20 pages of gobbledygook I sent the Commission on Ministry 35 years ago. Um, 
So how come those of us who claim to follow Jesus aren't known everywhere for doing these things? How come our communities are not responding like those villages and towns responded to him? Is it possible for us to form a movement around decentering the church from the heart of empire to the margins? The earliest disciples were effective, even though, like us, they got distracted with their internal struggles and questions about boundaries, and they often got off track. The earliest followers of the Jesus movement believed that the call of discipleship was about living lives of feeding, healing, forgiving, and raising the dead. It was about living the Great Commission. The cross is less about Jesus dying for my sins, as I was taught in childhood, than it is about being transformed by infinite love and then giving that love back to the world. One aspect of a liberation tradition that I most appreciate is the concept of evangelization, or the lifelong process of conversion. Here, evangelism is not associated with a technique or with numbers, but rather a spiritual practice and a process which involves listening for the will of the Spirit and naming and sharing the love of God throughout the world. I find that an increasingly important aspect of evangelization are efforts in education and formation for those who already claim a Christian identity, but who for various reasons have never progressed to an integrated faith that takes a critical look at difficult questions. What is passing for Christianity in media today is alarming. Or Facebook. <laughs> Who are these people? Living in such a religious country with such a low level of religious literacy is dangerous. Not surprisingly, there is ample proof that systemic religious illiteracy leads to violence. Living in a so-called Christian nation which appropriates the values of empire, not only reinscribes oppression, but upholds it as sacred truth, and it is the basis for most of the religious violence today. Exclusivist claims rooted in empire instill the belief that just as God rules over all creation, so it is just that the privileged rule those considered inferior. Oppressive societies are both violent and possessive towards the oppressed in the insistence that they should be grateful for their marginalized status. We need to raise the bar in terms of religious literacy, or we will continue to remain vulnerable to fear-mongering and exploitation in the name of our religious traditions. Moreover, we stand to lose our capacity to reimagine a relationship with creation capable of instilling hope among the next generation who will inherit the planet, or what is left of it, from us. Next question. What does a movement that captures the values and ethos of EDS look like? That's a Valerie Batts question. She taught me about the look like question. How might this powerful, prophetic, your words, okay? How might this powerful, what's your word for EDS, okay? I knew you couldn't follow instructions. I love you anyway. Okay, one word for EDS. We'll do it right now. I'll go like this. How might this powerful prophetic, one more time. How might this powerful prophetic, that's better. You still sound a little bit like church people though. You're in church, you feel like you can't talk loud. I know. One more time, because I'm losing my voice. You have to help me. How might this powerful prophetic, that's better, go forth from this sacred space. In my experience, the value of small theological schools is that they provide a framework within which we can practice formation from the perspective of whole persons and community. Alas, it is the relative size and our desire to be attentive to whole persons that also makes small theological schools vulnerable and increasingly impractical in today's educational world. But there remains an infinite yearning for authentic community and that yearning may also be addressed by a movement centered in the heart of the EDS diaspora. Ironically, the best way we can witness to the legacy of EDS and to strengthen the mission is to show and to shout that we can give the world more than churches and theological schools. The call to religious leadership today can be understood to be recovery of the centrality 
of Christian mission. That is, life for the world inclusive of, but also beyond the gathered church. Perhaps we need to begin to see EDS in expansive terms, inclusive of the many ways people live together and work with our neighbors for justice and peace in the world. Another question. What then are some of the ways that the EDS movement unencumbered from the weight of daily institutional struggles, deferred maintenance, no money, governance, can remain a generative force in the theological education going forward? This is my list. You'll be asked to add to it later on today. This is my list. Remember, we're doing questions. Not necessarily that I have all the answers, but these are some of my questions. Number one, <clears throat> on a basic level, one of the first ongoing tasks is to be effective partners with our colleagues at Union Theological Seminary and work with them in collaboration in committed ways to support the values we hold dear about EDS into the future. It has been noted consistently throughout the history of EDS that the merger of Episcopal Theological School and its sister school, Philadelphia Divinity School, was indeed a very painful time, especially for those affiliated with PDS. This is karma right back at us, okay? Um, you know, the, the cycle of history is coming back so that, so that we're the ones moving. This remains true despite intentional efforts to embrace the, both, the best of both schools. One reason potentially creative institutional partnerships fail is a, why a great deal of energy is put into the distribution of assets and assembling programs. The energy needed to keep relationships generative wanes over time and space. We from EDS need to begin to see the thriving of union as integral to us as the history of PDS, ETS, or EDS, and even to a greater degree, given the challenges we have already rehearsed about theological education today. We need to be serious about giving time and treasure to the movement. Today is not a signal to stop giving. In fact, it's just the opposite. Time and treasure for all progressive movements within theological education and beyond is needed now more than ever. Number two, just as EDS has done for generations, we are charged going forward to work assiduously to support those who have callings in religious leadership, yet who do not have the structural supports needed to make theological education a reality. People of color, queer people, people who suffer from gender oppression, people who live in poverty, or those from the majority world, and all others who have historically come here to be taken seriously and to get an education that does not rob them of their identities or voices, will continue to need our help through scholarships, systemic access, intentional mentoring, and strategic pastoral care. This pathway begins in our home communities, churches, and local denominational structures, and it is a long journey that does not stop with graduation. The need for empowerment goes on. Number three, part of the genius of theological education as we've known it at EDS is an inheritance from the radical curriculum developed at PDS in the 1970s and their belief that religious information alone is not adequate, that formation for ministry is related to theory and practice, the integration of academic content, practical skills, and the ritual practices of ministry with knowledge of self, relationships, context, contemporary issues, and power analysis. The cultivation of wisdom and judgment integral for the practice of ministry depends upon theological education which prioritizes integration over fragmentation and stratification. We need to invent ways going forward to cultivate opportunities for the kind of theological education where the boundaries between the classroom and real life are porous and where the gifts and life experience of students are highly valued in the educational process. I don't know how many times I told my story here. It too is getting shorter, but I had a lot of air time 30 years ago. For many years, I have heard from individuals and groups about the need to create safe space. And while I understand the political, 
social, psychological, and spiritual dimensions of that need. I am reminded by those less privileged than myself that growing numbers of us are never safe. And given the imperialist statecraft now implemented at home and abroad, we are all increasingly endangered. One suggestion is the need to cultivate courageous spaces where we can listen non-defensively and speak honestly and strive together to engage the work of, of solidarity. If we believe that authority for ministry comes with baptism, then key to our charge is to vigorously advocate for theological education for all and support initiatives for those whose vocation is as a member of the priesthood of all believers to the same degree as we support those who will be ordained. As the borders of the church grow more porous and as institutional supports for ministry decrease, it will increasingly become necessary to ensure that all are supported in their daily ministries for the good of local communities and for the world. A recent study on pastoral imagination funded by the Lilly Endowment suggests that capacities for pastoral leadership are sparked early in life and take years of daily practice before they come to fruition. In addition to the focus on academic preparation for ministry, we need to raise up leaders of all ages with personal integrity and courage. We are surrounded by fake news and so-called leaders who lie and manipulate to accumulate and sustain their power. It is, not, it is hard not to let cynicism take over. Perhaps we can break through the cynicisms by supporting leaders of integrity and purpose that stand with the growing numbers of the marginalized. The baptismal living movement reminds us that each community already has within it the gifts and skills it needs to thrive. We are equal to the task before us. The leadership needed to take EDS into the world is already here in this room. Each of us gifted and animated uniquely by the spirit. Number five. Those of us who are part of the lineage of EDS need to go forward in creating support systems for resilience, which will prepare religious leaders for the realities of social and economic inequality which reside in churches, religious organizations, and the wider culture. PDS, ETS, EDS, and UTS all share in the historical tradition of theological schools committed to prophetic action including theological education for people of color, the ordination of women, civil rights, and LGBTQI rights. In a world where the majority are in some way disenfranchised, religion easily becomes a tool of oppression when Christianity limits itself to conversations about correct belief or remains focused on internal issues and when people are deprived of basic human needs. Those of us who are preachers, teachers, Activists, artists, citizens, administrators, parents, students, scholars, workers must engage in prohibitive responses to injustice for the rest of our lives. Six, to do the work we are called to do, we need to intentionally cultivate communities, new spaces, where religions can be freed from exclusivist and colonial past and move beyond unquestioned Western dominance. As early as the 1870s, and Dr. Cadwell pointed this out yesterday, ETS embraced biblical criticism. By the 20th century, students studied the Bible from feminist, womanist, post-colonial, and queer perspectives. As part of the EDS movement, our global participation and presence remains a critical need, as it was in the past on issues related to women's ministries and sexuality. EDS's long tradition of innovative teaching needs to continue to challenge theological education to consider the global, or the dialectical relationship between the global and local, including interdisciplinary, transcultural, integrative, and interfaith perspectives. Seven. We need to continue to build creative partnerships locally and globally. It has become a truism that the world is a smaller place than it was a generation ago. A generation ago, EDS had the vision to include feminist liberation, 
studies along with Anglican Global and Ecumenical Studies and Congregational Studies as strategic emphases which pervaded the curriculum. Although all students did not participate in all these areas to the same extent, most left EDS with some exposure to ministry through each of these, Christopher, this is another one of your terms, perspectival foci. <laughs> Perspe I was looking for another place to use that and haven't found one yet. Perspectival foci, in faculty meeting, he came up with this and we all looked at him. He was, he's great at terms and hyphens. He's great at anything that's happening. Um, perspectival foci, which expanded to include queer theologies, post-colonial studies, echo justice, baptismal living, and others. As an EDS movement, the ability to form alliances to increase the geographic and demographic scope of theological education will be crucial. For EDS to continue as a movement on the world stage, it is critical to examine ways to best utilize technologies to enhance digital mission, remembering, of course, that the school has been a leader in this area in the past. Going forward, there are many advantages to the informed use of educational technologies, perhaps the most important being accessibility. At the same time, issues related to technological literacy, sociocultural disparities, and neo-colonialist practices whereby wealthier institutions control, control the means of delivery, thereby shaping the content and method of education, need to be a part of the larger analysis on the use of media in theological education. That said, through the expert use of educational technologies, the EDS movement is capable of expanding exponentially and maintaining the connectivity of an effective global network. What would our churches and religious organizations look like if we took seriously the need for theological education for all? EDS's identity as historically Anglican Episcopal, but also ecumenical and interfaith, shaped my vision of what the reign of God will look like in palpable ways. Something like this, actually. Our Anglican forebears teach the value of comprehensiveness as a way of holding opposites together in creative tension. Living this type of spirituality requires a tolerance for ambiguity and diversity in approaches and in practice. The boundaries between Christian groups and other people of faith, as well as those of no religion who seek the common good, are porous, and our ability to forge creative partnerships locally, nationally, and globally will keep the spirit of EDS alive. Moreover, the ability to understand other traditions on their own terms without demonizing, assimilating, or subjugating them will continue to greater religious literacy and creative transformation. As EDS lives into its identity as a movement, what it means to be a theological educator also shifts, moving into the future. Heretofore, for many of us in theological education, much of the job required balancing the institutional needs of small schools, which could be exhausting, and other religious systems with personal vocation and scholarly production. I doubt that I would have the opportunity to obtain a teaching job, much less remain in theological education for over 30 years without being a member of an intellectual community like EDS or navigating the tensions between academic disciplines and the work of ministry in the world are created and affirmed. Going forward, without places like EDS and the relatively few theological schools with similar missions which remain degree granting, it is increasingly important that we find ways to raise up and support scholars and public intellectuals who we research and write about the spiritual, social, ethical, and political implications of theology today and who will shape the fields of theology and religion for generations to come. It takes a community or a village to raise a scholar in the EDS tradition. A faculty of world-class scholars as diverse as those at EDS now is uncommon across theological schools. During the 2015-16 academic year across ATS schools, and this is the most recent data, 
77% of all full-time faculty were reported as white, and 75.8% of all full-time faculty were reported as male. How years of turmoil may have hampered this faculty's ability to share their immense intellectual gifts with faith communities and the world, as well as the field of religion overall, is an incalculable loss. That said, ensuring that our graduate institutions continue to mentor scholars like the faculty at EDS is by no means a given. As there are fewer schools now hiring scholars, fewer degree candidates are accepted, and as degree programs get more exclusive, they also tend to get less diverse. Across American higher education, numerous studies have found that since 1980, faculty development has declined overall. The numbers of full-time faculty with the time to mentor students, as many of us experienced, is rapidly declining. Organizations such as the Fund for Theological Education, now known as the Fund for Theological Exploration, the Wabash Center for Teaching and Learning, the Hispanic Theological Initiative, and others will need our support systemically and financially to ensure we can continue the tradition of scholarship that EDS supported as we move into the future. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says that those who search for wisdom walk in the path of God. I suspect that many of you here today can testify to the wisdom you gained at EDS. I first came to EDS in my mid-20s, and the experience was transformational. I preached my first sermon, Clement of Alexandria. <laughs> last, that was the last sermon, actually, I preached to Clement of Alexandria. <laughs> I was standing right where Bill Condrath is sitting right now. It was terrifying, right? Uh, but it was five minutes, and the student that went before me went for 40, so everybody liked mine bitter. <laughs> Um, <laughs> also, when I came, I was in this diocese, and I graduated, you know, along near the time of graduated, we were sitting in Tyler, a bunch of women, and we did not know of a single church in the Episcopal church that had a woman as rector, including, uh, including uh, the diocese of Massachusetts, the one we were in, which was supposedly progressive. So I thought, well, I'll have to be an assistant for the rest of my life or go to graduate school. Guess which one happened, right? <laughs> uh, it was a good idea at the time, but it shows you how within a generation, you know, within a generation, uh, who we are and how we explain ourselves and how we people, our mission, can change so, so, so drastically and so much better and so much more transformatively. I knew when I came here that doing theology is an academic discipline, but I learned here that it's also about embodied practice and about the lives of people who suffer and hope and search for meaning. Institutional structures come and go, but there is always a need to reimagine how best to educate emergent generations. Religion's not considered the only source of meaning anymore. There are many ethical humanists who live fulfilling and general, generous lives. If, however, we believe that our spirituality is a source for liberation, we need to reveal through what we preach, teach, write, and pray how we embody that practice of freedom. As an early history of ETS notes, very early in its history, it was seen and acknowledged that any attempt to restrict freedom would be futile. <laughs> this was in 1890. Even while we affirm the strong lineage that is EDS, we must always be listening for new voices who have a right to be heard and taken seriously. Those of us concerned with the systemic collapse we see happening around us need to continue to find ways to use the insights of our religious traditions and the strengths of our gathered communities to be a moral voice amidst rapidly changing institutions. One of the great Talmudic sages, Maimonides, taught that while it is not our responsibility to complete the task of healing the world, we cannot refrain from engaged participation. In Christian contexts, we have been talking about it being time to reimagine seminary education for several generations. For EDS to live on, we need to get on with it. 
Our work together as a movement is just beginning. What lies ahead is the ongoing work of humanity in which each one of us shares a part. True learning is not about schooling, after all, but a recognition of the truth revealed most plainly in relationship and in community. Despite all the challenges facing theological schools these days, I choose to remain in places like EDS because of the people we attract, passionate and committed and high drama, <laughs> driven by intelligence, moral vision, a sense of humor, and a desire to make things better. Although there are those who deride theological education for being expensive and impractical, it takes incredible courage to care about it critically and compassionately. We need to recognize those here who have been working tirelessly for this school. I consider it a privilege to serve as a companion in the process. For the people who make the incredible sacrifices to teach and to learn in places like this, faculty, students, administrators, and staff, the opportunities for transformation are palpable. In this way, EDS is in the business of both challenging minds and strengthening hearts. At its most basic, the work of seminaries is about creating intentional communities of transformation. This work is yet to be fully realized. There is much ahead that we can do. I learned at EDS that if we first transform our understanding of ourselves as powerless, then everything changes. And we become empowered to expand our vision of what can be accomplished in the world by just a few. Homeward stretch. This past decade was marked by a great deal of struggle for many at EDS. Not the only season of struggle for the school, to be sure, but deeply traumatic for our friends and colleagues here today. Even in the most supportive of academic environments, working within small theological schools has the capacity to bring a great deal of satisfaction. But at the same time, it requires a great deal of spiritual, psychological, and physical stamina. It is easy to get depleted without ample opportunities to be nourished back. With these struggles comes a great deal of anger and grief and loss and betrayal, as well as a sense of radical interruption of vocations and relationships. The dream for many of this school has changed irrevocably, and that needs to be acknowledged before the healing can begin. If we do not transform our pain, we will not only hurt ourselves, we will most assuredly transmit it. By the sheer fact that we are sitting here alive, we have access to the power of love and life restored, resurrection. For those who continue to suffer from the trauma experienced here, healing can only begin by giving voice to the pain and by being heard by a supportive community of listeners. People or institutions cut off from their relationship systems do not heal. What does it mean to give over a major part of your life's work to a school when it closes? Unfortunately, the closure of, theolo closure of theological schools is not a unique event. And yet even though a major part of our profession is the education of pastors, we do not often heed our own advice. That the suffering of one brings suffering to the whole is a basic preposition of restorative practice. How we live in the balance between hope for the future while cultivating a healing environment for those still traumatized is an early test for the new EDS movement. If we take care to respond to trauma in ways which create meaning out of adversity, a more compassionate, more resilient EDS movement can emerge. Psychologists remind us that change is certain. It is biological and social, internal and external, of our own making and beyond our control. Yet it is still very hard to experience some changes as positive developments. But the pathways to hope in the face of difficult changes lie neither in endurance nor in denial. The pathways to hope of forced change is to begin again, to open our hearts to new possibilities. Wisdom, Octavio Paz says, lies neither in fixity nor in change, but in the dialectic between the two. 
No one comes out of an epic struggle the same kind of person than when they went in. That's not the way it works for schools either. It is possible, of course, to come out worse than we were before, but it's equally possible if we choose to learn from our experiences to come out stronger, wiser than when we began. If we look at the science about what is happening in our world and we don't realize that there are good reasons to be pessimistic, then we're not understanding the data. The world's suffering will not disappear anytime soon. That we are seeking to be religious leaders and scholars during a time in history when all living systems are in decline is an immense challenge. But when I meet people like you, who are working to bring reconciliation to our communities and to restore the earth, I feel hope. The Reverend Dr. Carter Hayward. Yep, yep, see, this is you. I told you I'd quote you. <laughs> Summed up the challenge in her new book, She Flies On, a white Southern Christian debutante wakes up. That's so you, that title. That's so you. She writes, if we the people, regardless of our political affiliations or religious beliefs, could find ways empathetically, of having such discussions, beginning with sharing, sharing personal and community stories about race and class and gender, we might be on track to bridging our divisions. If we could begin to agree that human beings, all human beings, have some basic rights that are foundational to a decent society, we might generate opportunities for public political debate in which our differences could be shared without hostility. Is such a conversation to our deepest roots as a nation impossible for us to imagine? Does such radical empathy lie somewhere beyond our reach? Or are we being invited by the spirit to join together in making history? One of the heroes of my generation, quoted many times at graduations, was the writer and poet Adrian Rich. She wrote, so much has been destroyed, I cast my lot with those who, age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. There are millions of people who are willing to confront despair and the abuse of power to restore some justice and beauty to the world. Today, millions are marching for people they will never know, from whom they will never receive a direct benefit. The scope of the activities undertaken for the good of humanity through the EDS diaspora in churches, faith communities, schools, nonprofits, households, and the larger world is her legacy now and for years to come. We are interconnected. Our fates are inseparable. This work that EDS prepared us to do will last a lifetime, and that is the basis for my hope. Let us signify to an EDS, once a small, often struggling theological school, which set loose a powerful movement for justice and peace and was forever known as a catalyst for the reclamation of theological education for the whole people of God. And let there be peace among us, and let us not be instruments of our own or another's oppression. Amen. my boss. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for your words of wisdom. And I'm aware that we are out of time, so it's not exactly time for entertaining questions, but Cheryl is around. So, and there will be the panel at 1.30. So, again, let us thank Shell with another round of applause. You can move now. <laughs> go out into the world, that's the whole point. And then you get lunch if you go out into the world. <laughs>